Hey everyone, it's Dee Marie and you're watching Breaking Bread, a video podcast created by Locked In where we meet at the table and have meaningful conversations with those who've been affected by the justice system or those who are active in reform. Make sure to leave comments, click like, and subscribe to our video as well as take us on the road through Anchor, Spotify, our Google Podcasts. Our special guest today talks about how COVID has affected the school systems, gives a better definition for critical race theory, and talks about how to narrow the learning gap through early childhood education. So let's get into the podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of Breaking Bread. Our special guest today is Superintendent Dr. Alan Musirino. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. You are the superintendent of Albert Riverside School District, correct? I am proudly the yes. superintendent of Albert <laughs> Unified School District. Unified. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, yourself and how and why you got into education. Well, I, I had no choice but to get into education, <laughs> okay. uh, Dee Marie. It, it, I was compelled. Mm. Uh, I had no other interest, really. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to coach athletics. Uh, I wanted to help to perpetuate education uh, as a profession because it meant so much to me uh, as the son of a, a eighth grade educated father who drove a truck for a living, uh, they focused and emphasized education in my life, and that was going to be the difference for me. And I'm from the generation where you want to do better than your family, mm -hmm. and, and get an education was the first step. Or I should say, kind of do be more successful than your father, I should say, not necessarily do better, but yeah. you know, be more successful. So going to school was really something that was uh, important to me and emphasizing my family. But my mom and dad couldn't necessarily help me with my homework, but they made sure I did it. So uh, I had no other interest, really. I wanted to be an educator, and here I am almost 40 years later, proud to be serving the, uh, the children in the Riverside community because it's a wonderful place. Absolutely, it is. So were you a teacher before and became a principal and then superintendent? How was like your graduation through the education system? Yeah, I've had a pretty traditional journey to the superintendency. Uh, I was a math teacher. My career started as a high school math teacher in Long Beach, Long Beach Unified School District. Uh, and I loved teaching math. I absolutely love teaching math because math did not come real easy to me. Not to me at all. Yeah, sure. a lot of people could tell mm -hmm. the same story. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that I would help those who, like me, in the math classroom struggled a little bit because you work hard, you could be successful oh, yes, at almost absolutely. anything. It's that positive mindset. Mm -hmm. So so became a math teacher um, and then taught for a number of years, actually, uh, both high school and middle school. And then I started on my principal journey, and I was a principal for 17 straight years. My last principalship was in South Orange County at El Toro High School, wonderful, wonderful spirited high school uh, in Lake Forest. Uh, and from there, I went on to the district office where I was assistant superintendent and then a superintendent, uh, now in my 10th year. Mm. Wow. So this has been interesting times, COVID times. So masking, is that still happening in the school districts? And what have you seen as far as the side effects of masking in the social and emotional, even classroom discipline um, of students in the schools right now? Yeah, well, to say that it's been interesting is understating yeah. it. It has been absolutely unprecedented and unique in so many ways. And there's a lot of silver linings, too. And hopefully over the course of the next hour, we're going to talk about some mm -hmm. of those great things that are going to result from this just incredible period that we've all shared together. And just sharing it all together is amongst those silver linings. Uh, you know, when you think about masking, you really think about two things. Uh, one is children who are learning speech and learning from those who are teaching them speech. That's obviously critical. And the other side is the emotional side, to be able to, to, to see expressions on people's faces. Correct. So for the youngest of children, masking's been a problem. 
because they're learning how to understand facial expressions. All the children, they could see from your eyes and other expressions. They kind of could figure it out, but certainly it, that's been a challenge. So because it's been about a year and a half of masking, I think we'll be able to overcome it over the course of time. So I don't think it's going to have a truly negative impact long term. The research suggests that students could still learn speech despite learning from someone who has their mouth covered because it's more about hearing. Mm -hmm. But the social emotional piece for the youngest of children, I think that is going to take a little more time to help overcome. But that's a big reason why there's so much social emotional learning in schools. Mm -hmm. That's among the reasons. And have you, what, what have you noticed as the biggest um, hurdle to go over in the school districts during this COVID time? Well, staffing is among the biggest challenges we've all faced because it's difficult to get substitutes. It's difficult to get a lot of the support staff uh, because, frankly, it's dangerous and you're exposed and a lot of uh, people did not want to expose themselves for 15 bucks an hour or whatever salary they might be making so that was a real problem uh, number one but 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 that's really the result of the overall general challenge that we all face which is learning loss children missing school mm -hmm. because the most vulnerable are the ones who suffered the most this is true and as a result of that when students did come back to school, we were not necessarily able to give all the support necessary because we had all these staffing challenges. And that was not unique to Alvord. That's all school districts pretty much everywhere. And because of having short staff, we weren't able to do all the things that we had planned and prepared to do, which really means it's going to take a little longer moving forward as far as mitigating learning loss and making sure that our children are, are caught up. And then, of course, socially prepared to learn in the future. Do you feel that the masks kind of put a barrier as far as um, not just facial expression, but just also just expressing themselves as far as um, just socially with students? Do you feel that there's a lot more kind of reserved now because of that masking that's happened? Well, I don't know about that, but I will tell you that uh, many students are still wearing them now that we have told them it's voluntary. Uh, many students especially adolescents and others struggling with their own identities, kind of like covering themselves up. Mm -hmm. And that's another challenge we're faced right now uh, is that some kids, like, you know how children have long maybe kept their hair in front of their face and a lot of other ways to kind of hide because right. they're not yeah. feeling good about themselves mm -hmm. at these really difficult adolescent periods in people's lives. You remember it. It was a long time ago for yeah. me, but I still remember <laughs> it. I think I may have been one of those who had like the long hair in front of my face mm -hmm. sort of thing, you know, kind of covering yourself up and massive actually uh, being worn by many kids and they like mm. hiding behind them, so to speak. But yeah, there's no doubt that it's unnatural. You're, you're covering your face. So of course, it's going to have an impact. Of course, it's going to basically slow down all of the processes, all yeah. of which developmentally speaking are important to mm -hmm. any child's development yeah so as a former math teacher um riverside is actually ranked below the national average about 38 percent and finland is about th ranks third in the world as far as in math and science so what they're doing is that they're giving kids more recess less homework there's not as um, much high stakes testing and those types of things what are we trying to do in riverside to be able to boost our scores and maybe what we can maybe take as a lesson from finland yeah well you know finland got on the international map as a result of the pisa study which was done around 2000 it's been a lot of years now uh, that that Finland got on our radar. Uh, and I think there's a real mistake in thinking that we can't learn anything from Finland because a lot say, well, this is America, it's a different place, different culture, different social structure. Everything is different. It's homogenous in Finland, mm -hmm. certainly relative to here. The poverty rate's 5% here, it's 33% in America. So very, very different. As a result of that, it, they've been written off. Well, the truth is, is that there's lots to learn from Finland, and we have learned. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, first and foremost, the community approach to schooling. That's probably what stands out the most because they integrate those social services and a lot of social supports into their education system. Number two, they respect their teachers. They pay them. They're mm. much more respected in, in society. And that's always been a problem. Yes. I mean, I'm a teacher. Yes. Always will be a teacher. Have incredible respect for a teacher. A teacher changed my life. The reason why I believe I was successful was because there was a math teacher in high school who really made me feel like I could be something special and and really propelled me. And I think we all have a teacher in our lives who have that soft spot. Mm -hmm. You have a soft spot for it. They're still yeah. in your heart. Um, and, and that's something that, that Finland greatly values. And they also consider student agency much more than we do here. Students have a voice much more so than here in America, which is really heavily legislated. School is heavily legislated in, in America. You know, we're driven by policies like No Child Left Behind, which focuses on a test mm -hmm. uh, at one point in time. Uh, Finland is pretty much the opposite. Uh, for every 45 minutes of academics in Finland, there's 15 minutes of, of physical activity. So lots of things to learn from there. And I believe we have, because you see a lot of bits and pieces of those things in our system here, but it needs to be even on a larger scale. And what are the, some of the things that you have implemented um, so far in the, in the schools that you've taken from Finland? Well, the social... Okay. supports I, I think first and foremost and this will be another silver lining regarding covid and as we continue to talk about education currently you can't really do that without talking about covid and the impact uh and and among the silver linings are those social services becoming much more part of it i think another thing that it's done is it's helped us to appreciate teachers yeah the, very much right that sometimes we lose sight of the fact mm -hmm. that these are special people committed dedicated and not getting paid a lot of money to do what yeah. they do and to do it under these circumstances under this pressure has been absolutely incredible yeah. uh, our teachers are wonderful they're they are the real heroes so i think that too is going to be one of the things we're going to look at and say we could do that better mm -hmm. and that'll be much like the the finland model but i think first and foremost to really be like finland you, you have to give students a voice mm -hmm. student agency is so critical and students have a lot to say yeah. about their own education there and that's really what i value most and i think most school districts recognize that it's just that the system is not necessarily designed for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once it continues to shift, I think you'll see much, much more of it. Yeah, absolutely. What are some ways that the school, the Albert, is celebrating diversity? Oh, we celebrate diversity in so many ways. First and foremost, by being role models and being proud of who we are and bringing who we are in all of our interactions with everyone, including our kids. But like most school districts, you know, we're real big on trying to value every single child in every single classroom. So you, know, you see a lot of things like those cultural bulletin boards, cultural calendars celebrating a variety of different events this month and that month to, to recognize recognize and, and value a particular population, particular gender, for example. You see those great maps up on the bulletin boards with a, with a little red pin where each of the children come from, uh, each child comes from in a classroom, and then they're all connected by a little string. So mm -hmm. you could see really how big a world is yet, how small the world is. Uh, you have multicultural celebrations, of course, in music and art and literature, you do your best to make sure that that's diverse and that children feel important because really multicultural edu education, much like cultural relevant pedagogy, is all about helping a child feel valued and feel important, feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And when you think about children who do not belong, what that's why children, they gravitate to gangs and, and, and other groups where they belong, where they 
feel wanted and important. Mm -hmm. and, and we have responsibility to make sure that our children, first and foremost, are comfortable and in a position, in a space where they feel valued. They're not going to learn if they aren't valued and don't feel important, don't feel worthy. Correct. So cultural relevant pedagogy, multiculturalism, all these different terms uh, are, are all uh, kind of wrapped up in this very basic concept of, of belonging. And great teachers know how to make a child feel important. Sometimes it's as simple as just pronouncing their name correctly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, a lot of our textbooks, um, you know, are missing a lot of our cultural um, aspects, you know, from different, um, from the black community, from the Hispanic community, from the Asian community that they've, they've done towards our history. It's not necessarily in our textbooks that we teach. How do we diversify so we still stick with the textbook, but also include these cultures that are missing from this history? Textbooks really aren't driving education like they used to. In fact, many school districts you'll find have outdated textbooks. Because until that textbook adoption right. comes around again, and in some, in some subjects it's not as critical as others, but in history and social science, obviously it changes all the time. And you may find that there's some textbooks that some schools use in some districts that... Uh, don't really even have a current world map. Hmm. It changes so dramatically. So I, I think that's, that's important for everybody to understand is that's not always driving our work. Um, but but it's, it's really the social science, history and social science framework that, that we follow. Uh, and that's all about cultural relevancy and historical perspective. Uh, and, and all of the frameworks for all subjects are the same. We want to value diversity, value where children come from, and make sure that everyone recognizes that people interpret history differently. Mm -hmm. What we want children to do is interpret it from their own lens, and we want to give them the tools to do so. Yeah, absolutely. So a big hot topic that's kind of happening right now is critical race theory. Can you explain to everyone what that is, and do you agree or disagree with it? Well, let me change hats for a, a bit, uh, Dee Marie, if I may. Yeah. So I've, uh, I, didn't, I don't think I shared when I was doing my introduction, but I, I also uh, am a member of the faculty at Cal State Fullerton in the Educational Leadership Department, where critical race theory is among the primary frameworks mm. that we use to study organization. So it's a theoretical framework. Of course, most people know because it's been on the scene uh, in the last couple uh, years or and certainly you know, in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone knows it's a legal framework. It was originally developed as a legal framework to look at our systems and, and how racism might not necessarily be someone's individual biases or, or, or feelings about race. It's more about a system, how a system is set up to perpetuate it. So we use it all the time. And, and, and most of the problems of practice that we study for this doctoral level work uh, is using critical theory, critical feminism theory, and critical race theory amongst the two most common. So really, it's just a matter of looking at things from a different perspective. So I think there's a lot of confusion about what critical race theory is, and I think it's become an umbrella term mm -hmm. for, for much more than it really is. And of course, it's being used as a political tool yes. as well. Yes. My job as a superintendent is to try to keep politics out of the classroom. So when we look at problems of practice. Uh, we long have used critical race theory in education to look at, at uh, discipline because children of color are disproportionately yes. suspended. Yes. They're disproportionately expelled. Uh, in one of my former districts, uh, I ran the educational program in, in the, uh, the correction institute in Los Angeles in, in uh, men's uh, in central jail downtown, Twin Towers. Um, and, and when I was there with, with, um, with all of the, uh, uh, students in this program, now they were all behind bars, um, they all had a story about how they got there, uh, 
and and very few of those stories didn't include a negative educational experience. Mm-hmm. Either they struggled to learn, or they just never felt like like they belong, like who they were, how they were, how they were raised didn't fit in to the typical school because there's norms for school, right? There's normative behaviors that we expect. Now, I'm a good Catholic boy. I grew up learning how to kneel, stand, and sit on command, right? That's what Catholics do. You go to church, and they teach you. You kneel, you stand, you sit. (laughs) So I was kind of prepared for school in that Mm -hmm, regard mm -hmm. because those are the normative behaviors where you're expected at school. But every culture isn't like that, and everyone isn't like that. So the system was not necessarily set up and designed for those who didn't fit into that mold. And if they didn't, what happened? Well, you got put into the pipeline. And oftentimes that pipeline led right to prison. So the school to prison pipeline, of course, is something that we've been talking about for a very, very long time. So back to this concept of, of looking at critical race. So at what point does it really impact children? So we have commissioned studies to look at societal factors impacting education forever. You could look back to the Coleman report in the 60s. You could look back to Brown versus the Board of Education. So you have the legislative branch, then you had with the Coleman report, the executive branch, and then of course you've seen the courts mandate many things, yes, including busing. This is our society that we have to figure out how best to educate all children. If that means we need to look at problems of practice through a critical lens, then then that's what we need to do. But the idea that that itself is being taught in school is where the confusion is. Mm -hmm. That's not taught in school. What is taught in school, which I think is what people are really thinking about when they use critical race theory as this umbrella term, is that we're indoctrinating uh, young young children and maybe uh, white people in particular that they're bad because of this system. And that's just not true. Well, first of all, they're not bad, number one. Yeah. Number two, that there is no indoctrination mm-hmm. going on. What we want to do is give children the tools they need to be able to develop their own perspective. So of course we want to provide history and all subjects for that matter from a variety of different viewpoints. But children are gonna make up their own minds and at some point we wanna give them the tools to do so. Mm -hmm. Because they're gonna be, it's it's through their experiences of how they're living. So they're gonna make up their mind off of what's going on and what they're surrounded around. Exactly, right? They're gonna have their experience of this. So we could say this is the way it is, but well, that's not the way it is for me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's not the life I've experienced. So we have to be mindful. Once again, it's the comfort level that we wanna provide in the learning space that children could be comfortable and not feel like, my gosh, I'm the only kid who looks the way I look, or I'm the only kid who mm-hmm. has had this experience. Kids don't want to stand out, right? Right. So it's like this concept of being colorblind. We say, well, you know, we just see children. We don't see different colors. Well, we need to see different colors. Yes. We need to acknowledge who yes. all of our children are so that they're valued. Absolutely. Now you brought um, up the prison, t- the school to prison pipeline, mm-hmm. and so what is Alvord doing as far as for those students that come from adverse um, backgrounds, and those that are black and brown um, that are needing this extra support or are coming from again adverse backgrounds? What is Alvord doing as far as funding or programming to be able to help them through school so that they have a better experience, so that they don't have like the stories that you heard from from the incarcerated population population about school yeah even prior to covid um i'm very proud of the work that's been done in alvord and prior to me uh, as well and i think our labor partners our board of education and and all the great educators who've come before me have done an outstanding job because we have counselors at every single one of our elementary schools that's a very important and very few districts have that yeah uh, we have a robust student services division, which really focuses on wraparound services. Uh, We have lots of counseling, lots of partnerships with outside agencies. When you say wraparound services, what do you mean? Well, wraparound services mostly speaks to all the variety of different community 
agencies that provide social support. So if a family is struggling in one way or another, then you're able to connect them with a partnership. We also have uh, internal programs like a very special program that uh, one of our trustees, Carolyn Wilson, uh, founded, which is called Alvord Cares, which connects kids and families to, to resources, including food. Uh, right, the most basic of all, because yeah. we've been talking all all year, but way before COVID even about Maslow before Bloom, really looking at those basic mm-hmm. needs so that again children could be in a place where they're comfortable. Yeah. So in in addition to that, we have a lot of career and and technical education programs. Uh, we have a lot of support programs like Puente and Avid, which provide additional supports for children who need that extra boost. They need that extra academic support. We have intervention programs. We have a very, very robust program, which has been helpful as we moved into the COVID era because we had most of the things that most districts are now implemented mm. already in place. And again, that's a tribute to our labor partners as as well as our Board of Education and all the educators in Albert for recognizing yeah. long before a pandemic that children have a lot of needs. And if those needs aren't met, Learning's they're not, not going to happen. Learn. They're not going to learn. Yeah. What are some of the top... Um, initiatives um, that are top issues that are facing your administration right now? Okay, let me tackle one of those at a time. Uh, Top issues is learning loss, is how we are now going to make up for lost time. Many of the most vulnerable children were missing in action. Even if they were there, they really weren't. Right, right. That's that's a long time, a long term proposition. That's not going to be something you know we do in a summer or in a year or even two. This is part of a bigger plan mm. to slowly catch a child up. It's not like you could just cram more hours in the day of a, of a seven year old. So you really have to be mindful moving forward about how to continually improve and get a child caught up to where they need to be. We used to be focused on reading by the third grade so that they could then read to learn. Well, we have our current first graders never been in school mm-hmm. since COVID struck uh, in, in March of 20. So you have a lot of children that, again, we need to focus on helping them from a social perspective because learning social. And if they're not socialized and in a position to learn how to learn, they're not going to learn. Now you get them move. Now then, then now they're even further behind. Mm-hmm. So then it kind of, kind of perpetuates itself and builds on itself, making it much more of a difficult. So that is by far the biggest challenge we face. Uh, is is how do we get those children caught up, particularly the kids who transitioned from middle to high school during the pandemic? They've missed out on the freshman year. Uh, they missed out on part of their sophomore year or it's been just different yeah right not normal Mm -hmm. Uh, all of which is a challenge because we don't have as much time with those children have a couple years of school left so it it really is the issue that all educators are are losing sleep over which is how do we get our children back to a place where they could learn mm-hmm. where they could be competitive. Has the testing changed? Like state testing, is that going to have to change? Yeah. Because obviously with the learning loss, that's- Yeah, the- so so it, it was uh, it, it was not done the last couple of years. Testing became local, which is great because it should be local. And, and in our case, diagnostic. So it could be utilized as a tool for teaching. And, and that's been a good thing. This year, testing's back, although it's somewhat modified. So there still is going to be testing, uh, but it's, it's, it's not taking the same amount of time as it has in the past, although we don't know what's going to happen moving forward if it comes back or not. But, but that shift to more diagnostic and local testing has been, been another silver lining in that it's useful to drive our instructional programs, whereas the state tests one, you know, one 
you know, it's done once a year, is not really informing instruction. It's informing bigger picture stuff, it's certainly scope and sequence and curriculum in general, but it's not really informing instruction, like a diagnostic tool that really allows you to get granular to be able to go back and let's identify the skills that this child needs so that you could scaffold up to that, to that next level. Mm-hmm. So outside of the, um, the deficiencies or the, the lack of um, the kids being a little bit mm-hmm. behind, is there anything else that's a top issue in, in the administration? Well, certainly the social elements, because again, uh, we've seen a lot of behaviors that have uh, escalated to the point where we recognize that children uh, really struggled the last couple of years and, and it's made a difference. So they have to kind of get re-socialized. That's another big issue. But we also realize that behaviors are tied into learning, right? When, when children are engaged in learning and successful, there's fewer behaviors or behavioral uh, issues or certainly the more chronic behavior. So it still starts with providing that healthy learning space for children, positive, encouraging school climates uh, and cultures where th- children could thrive. And then usually you see fewer of those behaviors uh, become chronic. Mm-hmm. But but certainly just the whole uh, challenge, the economic challenges many families have faced, just trauma in children's yeah. lives. Yeah. Uh, children who we learned about through the pandemic because we were in their living rooms. Now, many, many children did not go on video, um, but but many did. Um, and, and I think it built the collective empathy amongst uh, everyone uh, that we don't really know what these kids until are we through. really yeah. know. Yeah. And so many more home visits, which is part of the community schools approach. So many more visits to, to learn uh, what we could do better to help this child because so maybe they're not coming to school or they're not performing. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're there, but we don't see them and we don't know if they're learning, they're not responding well. Uh, all of it has really helped us to, to understand just what types of challenges we truly have. And again, this collective empathy yeah. that we all have recognized in that sometimes we we tend to forget we have our own lives and we tend to think well maybe everyone else is kind of like us have nice environments and have a place to learn have mm-hmm. a place they could do their schoolwork well we found that you know many overcrowded homes and there really weren't a lot of spaces for for children to 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 be able to focus. Even though we gave yeah. them the MyPi, yeah. we gave them the Chromebooks, they still didn't have a place or a space. Mm-hmm. And certainly with maybe a larger household, and it became a real challenge here. So it certainly wasn't equal. Yeah, for and, sure. And the most vulnerable, of course, are always left behind. the ones who are yeah. left behind. Yeah. Is there anything that Albert is doing to be able to show more appreciation for its teachers? I write to my staff every every Sunday night um, to say thank you, to keep them up with what's happening in the district, um, and to make sure that they feel valued. Mm-hmm. You know, we do the standard appreciation events, but I, I think it's 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 much more than that it's it's about providing professional learning it's about providing all the support necessary uh we have a a a pretty good support system in place for for mental and behavioral health uh so that we are able to provide that support our 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 teachers particularly our certificated employees have an outstanding um uh, health and welfare system program benefit program um, and all those things have, have been good to, to provide that counseling if necessary, the mental health support if necessary. Um, we have done our best to ensure that whatever supports we could provide, we're willing and able to do. 
And again, I think it's really helping them to be successful. Teachers are used to being successful and they want to be successful. Well, teaching remotely was difficult. It was hard to be successful and it was affecting their mental yes, health. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, they want their kids to do well and they felt like they just didn't have control. Mm-hmm. When the child's in the classroom, at least they could have more control to be able to help them and they felt powerless. So we did our best to provide tools. Uh, we brought on programs like Go Guardian, which allowed them to be able to, to monitor the child screen so they could see and keep them on task. And then a lot of professional learning to utilize remote learning and teaching tools. And then, of course, once children are back, same sort of thing, just providing a lot of professional learning and support. We also have a day, uh, one Tuesday of every week, that teachers have time to to work together, to collaborate, to work on professional learning as a, as a team as well. So mm-hmm. uh, Alvar's a great place to work. Yeah. I know um, something that's out there. Does testing, um, do testing scores um, uh, affect funding from the state to each of the schools and school districts? Well, it doesn't necessarily affect funding. Funding is affected by one thing, and that's the combination of enrollment and attendance. So you're funded based on how many kids show up to school every day, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, where testing does affect funding is you get additional funds if your school is on what's known as school improvement uh, because it has failed to meet certain criteria. Then you get additional grant funds to improve your outcomes. Mm. Is there pressure that goes on the teachers to make sure that that funding comes through from the testing for those schools? I don't think there's any pressure on teachers for that. I think teacher pressure is all internalized. I think it's because they want to be successful. Mm. The teachers are bred to be successful because they realize that these children rely on them. They're their lifeline in a lot of cases. So I think teachers put a lot of pressure on themselves for kids to be su- successful, but we don't focus on the test in Alvord. I've never been a superintendent who really thought or at, at, at any time emphasized a single test at one point in time. It's simply one more tool, one more measurement that we could use. Mm-hmm. Uh, And certainly we know the public looks at it, so it's important, obviously, that we are teaching the standards, but the test is really there to let you know how well you're teaching to the standards. But much like when we talked about Finland earlier, if testing is driving your curriculum, you're going to tend to teach more towards that, Mm -hmm. and you're more likely to not take that extra time and use those extra moments and those teaching opportunities, learning opportunities, because you want to stay on pace. Mm -hmm. I got to get to such and such a a place by March 12th, or I'm going to be behind, you know, that sort of thing. And this is where relaxing testing was really helpful and that teachers could take the time necessary, especially now. We know that there's a lot of social, emotional needs of children. We know there's more disruptions in the classrooms. There's mm-hmm. more things that if teachers can't take that time to, to really help their children and create those environments, well, then more children are not going to learn. So if you're focused on staying on the same page at a certain point in time, then you're going to lose those opportunities to teach the whole child. And that's really what student agency is all about, giving students a voice. Well, you got to take the time to let them speak so you could hear their voices, right? You have to do uh, activities and events where children are heard. And that means you need to slow down. That means you need to put this lesson aside right now because, you know, we really have to do some restorative work right now. Then that's what you have to do. And I think our teachers have the license in Albert to do that. Mm -hmm. Are there any new initiatives that are going to be coming down uh, the pike that you're excited about to be rolling out in Albert? Yeah, I am particularly excited about 
two initiatives. One is a special a grant that we receive from an organization known as the Oak Foundation, and this is for a multi-tiered system of support, commonly known as MTSS, mm-hmm. which is a framework for providing timely interventions to children who have additional needs. So basically 80% of your children are, 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 are satisfied by your basic programs that provide a lot of variety and, and provide all the supports the average ch- child needs. Well, then you got another 20% who need additional support. And then, then you have another, out of that group, 10% who need even additional supports. All the way up right. the pyramid, right? Education's big on pyramids, yeah. <laughs> right? From Maslow yeah. to, to PBIS to MTSS. So, so we're piloting, piloting with an organization known as West Ed, which is a wonderful uh, support uh, organization uh, that I've done a lot of work with in the past. And we're going to uh, implement at three of our elementary schools a pilot program for MTSS. And we have a district in Rock Island, Illinois, that's also funded for this. So it's going to be a study. So we're going to implement, we're going to study it, we're going to evaluate its effectiveness, then we're going to continue to improve it, which is among the things that I value and why I also work at the university level in higher education because being research practitioner is critical Mm -hmm. from every perspective from best practices to really understanding what a theoretical framework is all about so that you could really study a problem in totality because if you're going to solve a problem you need to know how to study it first of all so, so that's one initiative, and I'm very excited about that. That's going to be at, uh, at Myra Lynn Elementary, at La Granada Elementary, and at Terrace Elementary, okay. three of our wonderful elementary schools. So that's going to help us to really create this, this framework uh, the right way, and then, of course, we'll be able to replicate it at all other schools. The other initiative is, is uh, a state initiative that, uh, has three billion dollars behind it, and that's called the uh, Community School Initiative. And I've already referenced it a few times. But community school is kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different things. This is an initiative that's designed to provide wraparound services to schools. So this is where you're integrating all of the elements of of child development mm-hmm. as well as community development. So for example, there was a movement in the 80s when I started teaching. I know that's hard to believe looking at me. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but truly in, in the mid 80s there was a movement known as caught in the middle and this is when middle schools were first conceived as opposed to junior high schools. Used to be all different types of models out there, right? There were some some seven, eight, nines, high schools right. that were 10 through 12. There was just a lot of different models, and there still are actually around the country. But nonetheless, the Caught in the Middle movement was a California uh, initiative, uh, and it was all about looking at the whole child and, and grouping kids in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades together. So elementary schools, which were traditionally through grade six, became through grade okay. five. Developmentally, it was more appropriate to have sixth graders with seventh graders than with, mm-hmm. with fifth graders. But it was all about looking at the child holistically. So we're looking at not only their academic development, clearly, which is the main intent of school, but also their psychological development, their mental development, their physical development, their social development, truly the whole child. So this was this was 40 years ago. Well, here it is again, made a comeback. Why? Mm-hmm. Because it never truly rooted. Right. It never truly got to the point where that became the norm. The middle school concept has come and it's gone. We still have six, seven, eights, and we do use the middle school concept, that caught in the middle concept, where we look at the whole child. But until you have an infrastructure that's designed to support it, you don't really do it as well as you could. Mm. It's about fidelity. Everyone in education is all about initiatives. Some of the education scholars and researchers, many that I work with, talk about initiative-itis. Mm. right you over initiate right. there's so many initiatives coming and going 
Well, we learned from Jim Collins' work, good to great, that you're more successful or more likely to be successful if you do less but do it well, right? That hedgehog concept, this idea about not having so many billion things that go in that you spread yourself too thin. Focus on a couple of things, but but do them well. So I think that's among my philosophies. So this community schools initiative, we are in the process of writing a startup grant right now. It's due, uh, it's due April 1st, which is this week. Yeah. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And that's going to provide us with the uh, dollars to support this startup, which means we'll be able to get some of the pieces in place, get some staff hired, uh, and begin this process of creating a, a task force to develop this program. And it's all about integrated services. Yeah, It's all about developing not only your children, but your schools and your community. Lots of ownership. In fact, doing what we're doing right now is an example yeah. of a community-based program. You are here helping your community by providing information. Mm-hmm. So anyone out there who is who are your your watchers, your podcast listeners, will hopefully learn more about education and learn how they could help, mm-hmm. because they all can help. Yes, right. So community schools are about just that. Yeah, your community, because who is going to benefit most from education? Everyone here, right? Everyone's home values. Yeah, the value of your average life, the quality of your life. It's all impacted by the education level. So it's so critical yeah. that school. And again, this concept is not new. In fact, I don't think anything is new, <laughs> uh, Dee Marie. I, yeah. and, and I also argue this, excuse me, uh, in my leadership classes when I talk about all the variety of different forms of leadership. You know, it's like movies, right? With the Oscars last night, movies are on everyone's mind. Actually, after that incident yeah, at the Oscars, yeah, that's probably right. on everyone's mind. But nonetheless... Yeah. Uh, you know, movies basically, you know, there's seven basic stories that have been retold for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's kind of the same thing with 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 leadership. Uh, it, it is still just it's just basically these ideas uh, that form the foundation of of virtually all different styles of leadership and all different types of programs, and they get repackaged and and renamed, mm-hmm. but they're the same thing. Yeah. Right. Schools function to support society. They function to allow your democracy to flourish by educating your populace, by ensuring that children have an opportunity to follow the American dream. And they need an education for that. Yeah. And if that's not a formal um, you know, academic education, then it's career tools, it's life skills, it's everything necessary for schools to function effectively. And I know one of the economic initiatives in the city of Riverside is to keep our talent home. We want to keep our, our children here. We want to keep our children local. We want them to give back yes. to their own communities. Uh, and you want to perpetuate that. So it starts with education. And it starts with us recognizing that our responsibility is is much more than meets the eye, and that's why it's that's why I love doing this, and I love your work, and I I really commend you for it because the public needs to know. Public needs to know how do I support schools, and they do it in a lot of different ways, from supporting bond measures to ensure that schools are current, that they have twenty first century learning spaces. Mm-hmm. They do it through giving in a lot of different ways, whether it's time by supporting PTAs, going to events, going to different games that support schools. And then they do it by providing services. If, in fact, they are able to do anything from tutor to have perhaps a company they work for support schools in one way or another. And if they have specialized services to be able to provide, then again, that's even one other way to to contribute. But we certainly want to make sure that in Alvord, 
uh, on behalf of my school board, uh, who, by the way, are wonderfully committed people to, to this community and to our children, uh, we want awareness together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're not too proud to ask. We want our community to own us because we are only as good as a community that we serve. Yep. Absolutely. Well, well stated, well put. Well, we can't just meet at the table and not share a meal together. So I asked Alan what he would like to eat, and he said he liked salmon. So I'm going to go get that right now. Yeah, before you do that, though, <laughs> let, let me talk a little bit about this, because uh, my name's Musarino. I grew up in, in a Italian home, both sides of my family. I'm a Siciliano on one side and mm-hmm. Musarino on the other. Um, and there was no salmon in my home growing up. Uh, we were meat and potatoes. Mm. We were we we were pasta all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, and and I discovered fish, uh, much as I discovered many other foods. I didn't even know they existed uh, <laughs> as a child um, until I became educated, honestly, and uh, decided that how I feel and my own health uh, and 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 just really live in a, a, a life that not only am I giving back, but I'm also modeling uh, for others is, is critical. So mm-hmm. uh, when you asked me what I wanted, I, I, I chose salmon because I, I eat well now. I, I don't eat the way I used to eat. I've evolved. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was tempted to see just how well you can make spaghetti and meatballs. Oh. And maybe next time, if ne- you yeah. have me back, oh, absolutely. then it's going to be spaghetti and meatballs next time. I got time. you. I got you. Perfect. <laughs> Let me go grab that right okay, now. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so I made Alan a sesame garlic salmon with rosemary garlic potatoes and baby carrots. So go ahead and try it yes, and let me know what you, you think. And, and, and on request, no <laughs> So thank you for that. Absolutely. And when I heard about your podcast and was invited, I was immediately interested. Breaking bread, what better thing mm-hmm. than that Exactly. To have a conversation? Exactly. Wonderful thing. <laughs> Mm. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. You passed the test. <laughs> now I just need to pass the meatball test next time. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> I, I told you, next time it's meatballs. Now, that's going to be a lot of pressure. Yeah, I know. Especially if in Italian. I mean, it's yeah, I got to be mm. on my on my A game oh, for yeah. you. So. <laughs> so, Alan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research that you've done and how to be able to close the educational gap and the disparities that happen? Yeah, so in talking as we have about the disparities and the differences uh, between children, of course, it's come to be referred to as the achievement gap. uh, We recognize that that starts very early in life. And technically, the achievement gap really isn't ever going to narrow because all children are, are growing. Right. So it's not as though children who have less early are not growing through school. In fact, most kids make great progress. In fact, kids on both sides of the achievement gap make similar progress, actually. It's just that they started behind. So both groups are right, really are parallel. Yeah, That's exactly. why you don't see you narrowing. Right. So among the things that you're hearing a lot about, and certainly the state of California uh, is supporting early childhood education. Because early on in in life, the standard deviation is less than it is later in life. So if you're able to begin the process of socialization and educating earlier in a child's life, you have a much better chance of helping that child when they start school. 
so they're not behind. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a piece uh, not too long ago. I don't quite remember the date exactly, but uh, called When the Gap is Smallest, which speaks to how critical early childhood education is. And early childhood education has really never been equal. Like there's Head Start programs, all these types of programs, but but they're not. The teachers aren't highly trained professionals in, in early childhood education mm -hmm. typically, and as a result, they're not the students. They are growing, and they are getting background and learning about the social elements of of learning, but they're not actually getting the same equality right. of education as someone who might get it in their home or who may have begun a process early on in a school in a community where they are providing a higher level of, of education because the teachers have a higher level of education like a tier five early child education program where the teachers have bachelor's degree as opposed to some of the communities in which they don't and you have uh, the, the instructors, the, the, the quote-unquote teachers in the programs, uh, you know, may be making, uh, may, may not be making enough to even right. make a living, right. Right? not even a living wage. So um, the state has poured mil billions into early childhood now, and now there's a push towards even credentialed teachers at the youngest of ages. Currently, children with disabilities will have a credential teacher at age three, but not in regular education. So the goal is to have teachers, early development specialists who are focusing on preschool age children to begin closing that gap early on in a child's life. So when they come and start school in the kindergarten, they are ready to learn. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing that that's a, a big, um, a big difference from people from kids who start early compared to those that don't without as far a doubt. As, yeah yeah so if a, ch if a child is starting school at the kindergarten level or first grade level because kindergarten is not mandatory mm -hmm. then unless they have had some learning experiences they're, they're behind. behind yeah they so they start behind so even though our schools do a great job of of helping that child develop mm -hmm. they're always behind yeah because the other children are growing too right and it's proportionate right well before we get our true grub on yeah. is there any last words that you would like to leave with our community you know i i, I first of all want to thank this community and i'm, I'm looking right into the mm -hmm. community right now you know i was at a event that the chamber uh, Cindy Roth and the the chamber put on last week where uh, where they basically thanked us and thanked schools for doing their share during the pandemic but I have to say that the city of Riverside has been absolutely incredible we have a couple of councilmen who specifically uh, support our schools because our schools are in their area Steve Hemingway who's been on this show mm -hmm. I know and Jim Perry uh, all of the multiple agencies, uh, the, the city staff have been absolutely incredible in helping us to, to navigate our way through the pandemic and provide us all the support. In fact, uh, just last month when the surge was occurring, we partnered with the city to set up a testing center uh, so that people go in and get COVID tested. So again, this city is absolutely incredible. And as a community, I've never felt more supported. Uh, and if you're wondering what you can do to help support our schools, um, you could be there for us as you have been. Uh, be there to support our initiatives. Uh, be there to support uh, bonds and other ways of helping us keep our schools current and, and build 21st century learning spaces. Do all the things that we will make you proud of being part of this Riverside community. So with that, more important than anything else, thank you for being a great city because it's a wonderful place to work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming uh, on. Do you have any uh, social media handles or uh, websites or emails that you'd like to share so people can be able to follow you and the initiatives that you have that are going I, on? I do. Every time you're killing me. Every I time know. I, every time I <laughs> get ready to take a bite, you ask me a question. That's just not fair. I know, That's I know. The last one, I promise. <laughs> last 
what yes, I promised. Well, well Al- alvarezschools.org, okay. our website, you can learn everything about our organization. Um, then you can find us at, at Alvard Unified as well, for Twitter, Instagram, okay. um, Facebook. Uh, and then for me personally, uh, com is my website where I uh, do a lot of work as a leadership coach uh, and developer of future leaders and also all my work at Cal State University where I'm a member of the faculty. So Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to come and visit uh, and and learn more about our organization as well as all the work that I do on the side to perpetuate education because Mm -hmm. I'm a superintendent, yes, I'm a member of the faculty of Fulton, yes, but what I really am is an advocate for public education and for kids. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are an amazing guest. All the information that you have that you've shared with us, thank you so much. And I wish you all the best on what you continue to do for not only our students here, but just in in our community everywhere as far as your research and everything. Thank you so much. Well, the pleasure is all mine. And I've learned about you as well. And I also appreciate the work you're doing. I think this podcast is great. Thank you. And I'll get the word out as well about this. But hopefully you'll have me back again. Yes, I would love to. Absolutely. Right. Love okay. to. And spaghetti and meatballs, right? Yes, absolutely. I already know what you want. (laughs) Thank you so much for watching this episode of Breaking Bread. Make sure to check us out at LockedIn.info where you can find more information on how you can share your story as well as all the initiatives that we're doing here at Locked In. I'll see you next time on Breaking Bread. 